his service today in the scripture reading and announcing the children's story. And I pray, Jude, that you will continue serving God. Amen. I want to thank also um, my wife, my helpmeet, my right-hand <laughs> person whom I could rely on. Let me tell you, church, every time I can rely on Cindy. We, we like working together. Um, <clears throat> sorry. It's, it's a pleasure um, working with her. So, Cindy, thank you. Um, for your support. Now, the title of my message <clears throat> this afternoon, forgive me, is, and Cindy mentioned it, what's in a name? What's in a name? Why do we have names? What are they for? How do we get our names? Now, Cindy mentioned that her names were given to her by aunties. Who gave you your name and why did they give you your name? And who was the first person to give names? You know, it would be interesting if we were in a room full of people, let's say 20 people, and everyone was called Chris Smith. Now, Chris is a name that is a unisexual name. In other words, it's a name for both male and female. It's spelled the same way, Chris Smith. And if you're in a room full of Chris Smith and you you'd attended, let's say, a training session, and the, the, the facilitator wanted to check that everybody had, a, had turned up and they pulled out their list and they said, Chris Smith, we would, everyone will turn around and said, present or here. Because everybody had the same name. What confusion there would be. And if later on a message came through that said, would Chris Smith please contact the reception, there is a message. We'll all, they'll all be wondering which Chris Smith. And maybe if they spoke to the person on reception and found out who sent the message, then the intended person, the intended Chris Smith would know that name and say, ah, oh, it's for me. But then they do that and found out that the message is from another Chris Smith who was not able to attend the training session and wanted some of the some of the the information that was given out you see the situation that that they would have who would be giving it which chris smith and in order to identify them rather than be going um you no 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 the other one yeah no no that that chris yes that one they would have to give them a number so you would have chris smith one chris smith two all the way up to 20 etc but names are not just for identification purposes. They're also used for referencing ancestry or lineage. And the thing about names is we value our names. And you know, Cindy was very careful when she kept saying Amaya when it should have been Amaya, you know? And little Amaya would be thinking, my name is not Amaya, it's Amaya because names are important to us. They become ingrained in our psyche. You know, if you're in a room full of people and there is that hum and buzz of, 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 of chatter and your name is mentioned, even if you're a few meters away, they psychologists say that you would pick it up. And I've noticed that you would hear your name and you're talking to somebody and you would pick up instantly your name. Now, in early societies, people used only one name for identification because the populations were small. As populations grew, so it became necessary to add more names in order to identify the individuals and their children. And as time passed and the population grew, we became more inventive and creative in, name, in the naming of children. So children were named after days of the week, for instance, certain 
cultures in Africa mm -hmm. name their children mm -hmm. after days of the week. Children are named after months of the year. Well, certainly the females are. We have April, May, and June. Mm -hmm. Children are also named after particular experiences or events. Only recently, a couple in India named their twin babies, a boy and a girl, Corona and COVID. <laughs> yeah. Now the babies were, were born to um, uh, Preeti and Vinay Verma on 27th of March during uh, the ongoing lockdown. And they said to the, the, the local TV news, the mother described how they wanted to make the day, in quotes, memorable mm -hmm. after, and in quotes again, facing several difficulties. She told the news agency, <clears throat> sorry, that although the coronavirus was dangerous and life-threatening, some good had come out of it, and not just the birth of their babies. They said the names would be a reminder of the hardships they faced during the lockdown. Children <clears throat> are also named after other people. Now, I was um, conceived in Curacao. Curacao is part of the, the Dutch Caribbean. I don't know if it still is, but certainly when I was conceived, it was. My father came from Barbuda, my mother came from St. Kitts, and they both met in Curacao where they were both working. And when my mother was heavily pregnant with me, she had to return to St. Kitts to give birth because my mother was not a citizen of Curacao, and the law stated that unless you were a citizen, you could not give birth to a child there. But before my mother left with her large stomach and me inside her womb, she told me that my father said to her, if it's a girl, you can call her whatever you wish. But if it's a boy, you must call him Milford Emmanuel. Now, Emmanuel is a Bible name, but the Milford part of it was from one of his siblings, one of his brothers. So I was named after my uncle. And I kept that tradition going, or I should say we, because one of Jude's three names is Milford. And I, I hope he will keep that going should time permit, should Jesus not return before he's grown up and have children of, of his own. Now, apart from naming children after other people and so forth, mm -hmm. we name people because we simply like the name. The name sounds good. It sounds, sounds interesting. And so we name our children after a name. We name them a name that, you know, that sounds good to us. Names are also given to develop or preserve certain cultural identities. Now, when we hear the name Lamisha or Laquan or, or Buka, you know, we automatically think Russian, don't we? No. Yeah? No. We think African American yeah, yeah. because that's where these names come from. And when we hear them, we think African American. And as Cindy mentioned, there are certain names that I'd never heard prior to my meeting her. And those names were the monstration names. I mean, I won't go into, in, into some of them, but when I heard them, yes, I, I, I was a little bemused, as it were, but I've got used to them now. And, you know, they're, they're, they're commonplace to me. But, you know, those names are important in developing and maintaining a cultural identity. Identity. So when you hear those names, you think, ah, instruction, ah, African-American, or wherever um, we are from. 
So it doesn't matter how the name sounds, they are important in that aspect in developing and maintaining cultural identities. We also have middle names. Why do we have middle names? After all, we seldom use them, except when we're filling out <clears throat> official documents or when we write our initials or something like that, etc. But you know, another reason could be, imagine <clears throat> you're a teenager, middle teens, or a little bit younger and you're at home and mother comes through the door and you're in your bedroom. If you hear Freddy, then you know all is well. But if you hear Frederick, Augustus, Archibald, Smith, you don't need the BBC World News to tell you that something is wrong and that you are in trouble. But on a more serious note, the custom of having middle names goes back to ancient Rome. Many Romans had three names. They had the pre nomen which was the personal name. Then they had the nomen, which was the family name. And they had the cognomen, which indicated what branch of family they were from. And the more names a person had, the more respected they were by others. Women had two names and slaves typically had one name. And an example of the Roman names with the three names is Gaius or Gaius Julius Caesar. Now this tradition of multiple names spread over to Western cultures in the 1700s. Aristocrats would give their children long names to show their high place in society. The Spanish and Arabic cultures would give their children paternal or maternal names from previous generations to be able to keep track of the child's family tree. Let me say that every parent has the right to name their children whatsoever they please. However, some of them abuse the privilege. Mm. Let me give you some examples. There was a couple in China who wanted to call their name, their, their, their son, a particular name, but they were denied by the officials because that name, and I don't know how they said it, how it's said, it's the symbol that's used in the email address. You know, that A with that kind of half circle around it which means at or each. That's what they wanted to call their son. There's, another, there's a couple also in New Zealand, Pat and Sheena Wheaton. When the, the, the scan of their child was shown to them, they were so excited. They were thinking, this is real. This is for real. And so they decided to name their son for real, the digit four and real. But the Australia, um, the New Zealand authorities stepped in and said no, because the name contained a digit and they do not allow uh, names to contain digits. But this couple were totally undaunted and they said that they may pursue the matter in the courts. In the meantime, they decided to, to submit another name, which for them was more traditional. And the name was Superman. Here is another example from New Zealand. In 2008, a couple were involved in court proceedings for custody of their nine-year-old daughter, whom they named Tallulah Does the hula in Hawaii. Tallulah does the hula in Hawaii. 
Why would you give your child such a name? And while it was, whilst he was in court, the judge noted that the nine-year-old girl never used the name. She told her friends to refer to her as K, whether the letter K or the name K-A-Y, that's what she told them her name was. She never told them anything about Tallulah doing the hula in Hawaii. <laughs> and the judge noted that in all the letters in the name Tallulah does the hula from Hawaii, there's not a K in it. And in his summing up, he decided to take that into account. And so the child was removed from her parents and placed into the um, protective custody of the courts. And she was given another name, hopefully one that um, wasn't the silliest one that anybody had ever heard. <laughs> Here's some more. In 1863, a son was born to Joseph and Anne Cope. And the child was born on a train carriage at Leicester Railway Station. And so they decided to call him Leicester Railway in 1899. And these, let me tell you, are true. The, 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 the source that I got it from actually had the, the, um, the birth certificates. 1899, a child was named by his parents, Thomas and Alice Day. They called him Time Of. So he was Time Of Day. 1870, Robert and Martha Goldstone named their son One Too Many. Don't know why they called him One Too Many. Maybe they had, he was one too many um, of their children. We don't know, but one too many. 1875, James and Mary Lyons, spelled L-Y-N-E-S, pronounced Lyons, named their son, and what else? Zebra. <laughs> Zebra Lyons. <laughs> that's it. Who would have thought it? And no, that's not a comment on what happened to Zebra Lyons. That's a name that was given by Robert and Louisa Restel in 1886 to their son. That's it. Who would have thought it? Restel. And just in case you thought that unusual names only apply to the boys, in 1882, Arthur and Sarah Pepper named their daughter 26 names, one beginning, each one beginning with a letter of the alphabet. Now, Pepper was used to represent the P. And so her names were Anna, Bertha, Cecilia, Diana, Emily, Fanny, Gertrude, Hypatia, Lug, Jane, Kate, Louisa, Maud, Nora, Ophelia, Quince, Rebecca, Starkey, Teresa, Ulysses, Venus, Winifred, Xenophren, <laughs> Yeti, Zeus, Pepper. Oh, now meet Hubert Wolfstern Sr. He was born in Germany in the 1900s. I'm not sure whether it's 1904 or 1914. And he is in the Guinness <clears throat> Book of World Records for having the longest surname. And when he signs his name, he would sign it um, Hubert B. Wolf plus 666 Senior. Now, I should have done a screen share, but I will just, um, let me see, I have it here. Hopefully, no. What I'll do is I'll show you from, oh, beg your pardon, here it is. Now, you may not be able to see. Keep it there. Okay, so you said keep it there. Yeah. Now, you'll see the black. Those are all the 26 names, but the green, that's one word. Yeah? And it ends with senior. Now he signed that on a Christmas card in 1963. What a name. And you can look this up on Google if you like. What a name. And in terms of the longest personal names now, <clears throat> that's in the Guinness Book of Records, not a surname, but the longest personal name, that goes to an African-American woman now, because when I first saw it, um, she came on the 
Oprah Winfrey show in 1997. You can check it out on YouTube as well. So she's called Jamie. And her name, her first name contains over a thousand letters. 1019, I think. Her middle name has 36 letters. Now, her mother gave her that name in order to get into the Guinness Book of World Records and for no other reason. It took six years to come up with and is made up of a combination of films, cars, countries, and family names. Now, when you look at the names that I've mentioned, we may be amused, baffled, or even dismayed by them. And some are quite simply ridiculous. But there's no escaping their curiosity value or the creativeness and effort by those who came up with them. Now, just in case there are other attention-seeking parents out there wishing to make a name for themselves by giving their children the longest name in the world, let me tell you that the Guinness Book of World Records no longer acknowledges longest name entries, presumably to discourage parents from setting up their children for a life of ridicule. Who first gave names? God first gave names. You know, the Bible said that he even gave names to the stars. If we look at Psalm 147 and verse 4, it says, He determines the number of the stars and calls them each by name. Astronomers estimate that there are about 100,000 million stars in the Milky Way alone. Outside that, there are millions upon millions of other galaxies also. So there are countless trillions of stars. And the Lord knows each one by its own particular name. And if we understand, and what we understand from the Lord is that he does not give names just for the sake of giving a name, because it sounds good. He give names for a reason. He give names because of a particular mission of the person whom he names. Genesis 17, 5. Neither shall thy name anymore be called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. Abraham or Abram means father is exalted. Abraham means father of a multitude. So the name that God gave him tells him or reminds him of the promise that God made to him. God didn't name him Abraham because, well, Abraham has a bit more than Abram. It means something. Genesis 32, 27 to 28. So he said to him, he being um, God said to Jacob, you know, when they had that, that wrestling um, that night, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. He said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Now, those are just a couple of examples in, in, in the Bible where names, that God gave names for a purpose. Two professors in 1948 at Harvard University published a study of 3,300 men who had recently graduated, looking at whether their names had any bearing on their academic performance. The men with unusual names, the study found, were more likely to have failed or to have exhibited symptoms of psychological neurosis rather than those with more common names. A rare names, the professors concluded, had a negative psychological effect on its bearer. To Lula does the hula from Hawaii, I think is one that comes to mind. 
More recent research suggests that names can influence our choice of profession, where we live, whom we marry, the grades we get, the stocks we invest in, whether we're accepted to a school or are hired for a particular job, and the quality of our work in group setting. Some of those findings have since had their critics in, in, in academia, but we haven't got time to, to, to go into that. We may wonder why people can be so influenced by their names that it affects their behavior. Mm. The truth of the matter is they do, which brings me to my central point. Most of us on this Zoom platform share the same name, Christian, mm. or Seventh-day Adventist Christian. We are named after Christ. The name Christian to me says responsibility. Responsibility to be a positive example to my immediate and wider family, to my friends and associates inside and outside of the church, to my neighborhood, to my fellow students, to my colleagues in the workplace or any place where we associate with others. I remember some years ago when I was studying <clears throat> at Birmingham Polytechnic and I was late for a particular class and when I got there the discussion was already on the way and as I made my way to a seat and I sat next to one of my African Caribbean colleagues he said to me Milford boy you have to say something and I'm thinking why and he said listen to what them are talk about and I was listening to the, to the discussion and it was about homosexuality and how acceptable it should be and all the rest of it. And they said, boy, you have to say something. And I did say something based on the Bible, the word of God. And I remember being challenged by the two senior lecturers who were facilitating the discussion. But my answers, my response was based on the Bible, the word of God. You know, one of my colleagues at the time who was in that um, discussion, and she made her comments before I joined the, 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 the meeting or, or the class, she was called before a, a specially convened meeting to answer to some of the comments that she had made, which were apparently derogatory. You know, church, as Christians, we have a responsibility to speak out or speak up without being rude or contentious or insulting or derogatory. On occasion, that responsibility may mean heading north whilst the crowd is heading south and you're jostling your way through them. I remember when I used to live close to Birmingham City Football Ground and I would mistime it and I would come out just when the match is finished and the crowd is coming this way and I'm going that way to the bus stop and I'm jostling through the crowd and, you know, oh, sorry, uh, excuse me and, and all the rest of it. And it was quite an, an uncomfortable and um, intimidating experience. But you know, there are times when we have to stand up for God, for Christ, in circumstances that are uncomfortable, that are intimidating in, in the spiritual or moral sense. I remember some years later when I attended a diversity training session and we had a discussion about, again, homosexuality. That one always comes comes up. And there was a scenario. The scenario was a, a family member, a close relative is coming to your house. He's homosexual and he's bringing his partner with him and they will both be staying in the same room. 
would you yes, agree, or you don't know, or no? And on the floor, there were three pieces of paper. I know I mentioned this at um, Ladywood Church before. There were three pieces of paper. And on one paper, it said, yes. And if you agreed, you stood there. And on another paper, don't know. And if you didn't know whether you say yes or not, you stood there. And on the other paper, it said, no. And there was a group who stood on the yes, they would allow it. And a bigger group stood on the don't know. And one person stood on the no. And that one person was me. Another scenario was given. And again, we had the three choices. Yes, um, don't know, no. Now the group on the yes, group on the don't know, and one person again on the no. It's not happening. And there I stood. And when, when it was first mentioned whether you want to stand on yes, don't know, or no, it, it didn't occur to me that I would, I would ever be the only one standing on the no. As I stood there, I was hoping that somebody would change their mind and come and stand beside me. Nobody did. There are times when God calls us and we have to stand alone all by ourselves. And I tell you, it is no less intimidating. It is no less uncomfortable than walking physically through a crowd coming your way and you're going the opposite direction. And in those situations, it's very tempting to deny Jesus because the pressure weighs heavily on us, like Peter. So we capitulate, we relent, we succumb, we yield, we give up, we give in, etc. And bring the name of Jesus into disrepute, dishonor, and disgrace. But as difficult as it may be to stand up and stand out, to speak up and speak out for the Lord in those circumstances or any circumstance, we need not be afraid. He will see us through. Isaiah 41, 13 says, For I, the Lord your God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. 2 Kings 6.16, do not be afraid, Elisha answered, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And when we wonder who is with us, there are times because of what we're going through, we wonder who is with us. The Aramaic Bible in plain English tells us in Matthew 1.23, our God is with us. In some versions, it just simply says, God with us. But in that version, it says, our God is with us. Philippians 2, 9, 10, and 11. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name above all names, and that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and earth and on the, the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's who is with us. So unlike most of those names that I mentioned, which are just mere verbal tags of identification, the titles or names of Jesus, and apparently there are over 200 mentioned in the Bible, mean something. They identify him as who he actually is. These are names not just given because of how they sound, but because of who Jesus is his power, his authority. So when we are hemmed in on all sides and imprisoned by painful circumstances, he says, I am 
your deliverer. And as we know, I am is one of his names. Psalms 144 and verse 2. When the way is hard and we find it difficult to endure, he says, I am your sustainer. Psalm 55, 22. Right. And when the cupboards are empty, the fridge is oh, bare yes. and the bills are yet to be paid, mm -hmm. fret not. He says, I am your provider. Jehovah Psalm 68 and verse 10, yes, Ooh. Jehovah Jireh. When the trials of life are pressing heavily upon us and we are powerless to withstand them, look to Jesus, says the psalmist David. He is my loving God Amen. and my fortress, my stronghold Amen. and my deliverer, my shield in whom I take refuge, yes. who subdues peoples under me. That's right. Psalm 144 and verse 2. Yes. When we find it difficult even to make it through the end of a day, mm. he says, I am with you even unto the end of the world. Amen. Matthew 28, 20. And the last part. Now, I understand the context in which it was said. However, if God is able to see us through our, our lives, the whole of our life period, then he can see us through one day. Amen. I want to encourage us with the following passage of scripture Amen. as we endeavor to live up to the highest name or title we can ever have mm. that name Christian. Ephesians 1, 18 to 23. And it's taken from the, it's the Amplified Bible's version. And what they do is in that version, you would have the scriptural text and it's amplified. And it says, and I pray that the eyes of your heart the very center and core of your being may be enlightened, flooded with the light by the Holy Spirit so that you will know and cherish the hope, the divine guarantee, the confident expectation to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, God's people. And so that you will begin to know what the immeasurable and unlimited and surpassing greatness of his active spiritual power is in us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of his mighty strength, which he produced in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, whether angelic or human, and far above every name that is named above every title that can be conferred, not only in this age and world, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in every realm in subjection under Christ's feet and appointed him as supreme and authoritative head over all things in the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills and completes all things in all believers. So what's in a name? When that name is Christian, it means something high and holy and honorable and noble to live up to. So what's in a name? When that name is Jesus, everything is in it. Amen. Our whole being, temporal and eternal, are wrapped up in that name. Amen. Psalm 34 and verse 3, I'll end on that. 
glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together because his name is power. It's might. They're not just lovely sounds. They mean something. May God bless us as we contemplate his name whenever we hear his name. Amen. 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 Amen.